Okay, good morning all. So, uh, we were talking about fly ash uh, primarily with respect to its collection and the uh, differences in the composition between type C and type F fly ashes, right. Uh, we also looked at the specific uh, types of coal from which after burning fly ash can be obtained and the quality and the composition of fly ash obviously depends on the type of coal which is being burnt. And uh, we also discussed the fact that in cement, uh, sorry, in thermal power plants, because of a shortage of coal, you can get coal from multiple sources because of which you do not really have a control on what you have in your, uh, 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 what type of coal you have and essentially what type of fly ash gets produced from it. So, cement companies that actually end up collecting this uh, fly ash for producing blended cement have to work around the fact that it may be a type C or a type F fly ash and because of that uh, the properties could be variable in a blended cement hence the control that needs to be exercised while actually producing the blended cement is much more right. It is not the same as obviously using it in a concrete mixture directly I mean in that case the fly ash is collected and brought to a ready mix concrete plant and that is where it gets used. There you can control the concrete characteristics right. So, there are several different ways of looking at it. Now, it, between type C and type of fly ashes we saw that uh, while there is not much difference in the particle size and morphology, there is obviously the difference in the calcium content that leads to different kinds of performances from them. Type F fly ash has essentially a pozzolanic performance whereas type C can exhibit some cementitious nature also in that it can undergo the reaction on its own in even in the absence of lime there can be some reaction because of the higher calcium oxide content. Obviously, if the calcium co oxide content is not high enough you may not get that reaction you may still need to provide sufficient quantities of lime. Uh, we also looked at some uh, uh, other aspects of the composition of fly ashes what needs to be restricted primarily and we were then talking about uh, again a larger study done in the US where they compared uh, several different types of fly ashes and looked at the composition characteristics. It is clearly seen that as the calcium oxide content increases the sum total of the other three oxides uh, is going down and uh, again the density also seems to decrease with lowering the amount of calcium oxide or increasing the amount of the silica iron and alumina right. So, uh, alkali content also seems to depend significantly on the ashes that have greater impurities have greater alkali content right. Class C fly ash is known to be from a coal that has greater amount of impurities. So, it ends up having a higher alkali load as compared to type F fly ash. Uh, we were looking at this structure there are solid spheres of silica which are the reactive silica but then they can also be these gas filled spheres which are much larger which can contain some of these solid spheres inside ok. Once the surface glass of these larger spheres breaks it releases the smaller uh, spheres which can be then used for reactivity. You could also have gas filled spheres that are very small in size which we call as xenospheres which are essentially used as lightweight aggregate you could also use xenospheres as lightweight aggregate. But all this means that you need to then collect the fly ash and do classification we call that classification oops sorry classification of fly ash. Classification means not classification with respect to composition classifying fly ash is a means of processing in which you are controlling the particle sizes right you are controlling particle sizes or you, you are controlling particle densities. So, low density material primarily composed of the xenospheres can be extracted in this fashion and xenospheres are available as lightweight aggregate today. Okay. We also looked at uh, the difference between as collected and processed fly ash and we saw that in processed fly ash there is a much greater fraction of smaller particles right which leads to much better reactivity in the system. Now, the problem obviously is processed fly ash will add to the cost of the material. If you go to the western countries you get fly ash just like you get cement as a processed material in bags and because of that you need to pay a price for the fly ash ok. In India a lot of the fly ash that is available for use in concrete directly is made available by suppliers who go and collect the, uh, the ash from thermal power plants 
and they supply directly to the RMCs without any processing. In such cases, your extent of variability you can expect is going to be much more, right. So, uh, because of this, uh, obviously, there is a problem in people's trust with respect to the use of fly ash because it is not really a controlled commodity when it comes to using as a mineral additive in concrete. But when you use it as a Portland porcelain cement, you do not seem to have that kind of a disadvantage. Now, unburned carbon could be there in fly ash for obvious reasons because you are burning coal to get the fly ash, the lighter particles of coal can fly off along with the fly ash and get collected along with the fly ash and that probably leads the fly ashes to have a distinctly blackish coloration and this unburned carbon needs to get removed or it needs to be within a certain range. Okay. If you do not do that, it can interfere with air void parameters lead to a per poor performance of the air entering agent. Okay. Sure. So, uh, again as I said too much of unburned carbon can interfere with air void param parameters leading to a poor performance of the air entering agent. Generally more air entrainer may be required to produce the same extent of air because of all of these issues there is also a loss in strength associated with excess of carbon in your system and your discoloration that happens carbon is very light right. So, when you actually place the concrete this carbon can come up to the surface and cause a discoloration on the surface and that is not something that is generally accepted from a quality perspective. Okay. Some of you have been on site right. So, how do you check quality of concrete? What, what are the specific parameters you look for? No, okay. Uh, all that is fine. After you pour the concrete in the form work and you remove the form work, what are some aspects of concrete quality that you look for? Bleeding. Sorry? Bleeding. No, again bleeding is in the fresh state. I am talking about hardened state. Honeycomb. Honeycombing, yeah. You look for honeycombing. What else? Efflorescence. Sorry? Efflorescence. efflorescence. Okay. Why would efflorescence happen in plain concrete? Maybe there are some additional salts in your water that may come up to the surface and would have dried there causing some coloration or some patches on the surface. What else? Again, this could be one of the reasons right. Uh, lighter ingredients like carbon for instance are coming up to the surface and causing a discoloration also on the surface. Is there a desired color of the concrete? In quality control do you also look at the color of the concrete? Okay. I mean yeah you expect concrete to be metallic grey, but on site do you make a distinction based on the color? Mostly not right. But if you imagine if you are constructing a very large wall and there are major changes in your color as you go along, the quality is not really being met, right. You have a problem, right. You've, you may, may have seen this in several applications, even in columns when you have suc uh, successive lifts made for the same column, there is a minor variation in color and that really puts off the entire appearance of the column. And these days, a lot of projects are moving towards as struck finish that means form finish. When you remove the form work no more finishing, no plastering nothing, concrete has to appear good like that. So, or in other words we call it fair faced concrete. So, there you are not going to be putting any paint on top of the concrete, you are not putting any extra coverings or coatings or plaster because of this such things can really affect the quality of your concrete. Now, only thing is of course, we check performance in terms of strength or durability. We do not really have a clear assessment of quality, right. We do not gauge structural performance in terms of quality. Honeycombing is an obvious issue obviously, you can see it, but color changes which could also indicate some change in quality are not really paid much attention to because in most cases we do some surfacing on top of the concrete, we put plastering. Okay, is plastering really ne necessary on concrete? Yes. yes. Why? <laughs> concrete is supposed to look good on its own. Why should you need plastering to make it aesthetically good? So you're saying that uh, if you don't do plastering, the surface of concrete may have voids. And so, so, if you do a proper concreting process, do you need plaster? 
Mostly not. I mean, actually, you don't need plastering on concrete at all. What do they need to do for making uh, for putting plaster on top of concrete? They need to roughen the surface so that plaster bonds to the concrete, and for that, they use a chisel and hack the surface. So you're actually damaging your concrete by doing that. It's a very poor practice. I don't know how it stayed for so long in the industry. It's extremely poor practice to do hacking on the surface of the concrete to put plaster. Of course, it increases the bond strength of the plaster with the concrete, but you are damaging cover concrete. And please remember, cover concrete is a key to durability of concrete. You are hacking, hacking will create cracks and that will lead to durability problems. Plaster is not going to protect against durability problems. Why? Because plaster is much more porous as compared to concrete. Plaster is extremely porous when you compare it to concrete. Right? The porosity of plaster, even if it is of the same grade, mortar will have more air in it and that is why it will have more porosity as compared to concrete. So, the porosity of the plaster is going to be much more than that of concrete. It will lack like a water sink. It will absorb the wa water and slowly the water will make it into the concrete through the channels. Right? Now, of course, when you have a case like this, we have discoloration of the surface of the concrete. In such cases, the plaster may help, but it may help only aesthetically. It is not going to affect the quality of your concrete or it is not actually improving the quality of your concrete. Right? The other reasons could be if you are using form work that has been already subjected to several cycles of use and reuse, especially if it is a wooden form work, it would have started warping. And because of that, the shape or the finish on the surface of the concrete is sometimes affected. So, in such cases, plastering helps to ensure that you have a perfect uh, orthogonality between the faces of the column or, or whatever structural member you are making. But again, it is undesirable, right? Imagine the time and cost that is spent on plastering in buildings, and it is absolutely a waste if you are trying to do plastering for concrete surfaces. Plastering for brick or masonry block surfaces is reasonably justified because you want to have a smooth surface on which you can do painting and other finishing. But plastering on concrete is simply unjustified. I think if you have an opportunity in your job sites to stop that, that would be the first practice to stop plastering of concrete surfaces. Okay, so that is very important. I also call it 3D printing. Using plaster to wipe out blemishes on the surface of concrete and give it a perfect shape. Essentially, that is man-made 3D printing. We will take a look later at the robotic 3D printing that has completely different applications, but this is our first instance of 3D printing where workers 3D print on the surface, right? but that is totally unnecessary when it comes to concrete. Right. So, apart from carbon which can lead to these surface blemishes and also interfere with uh, your performance of the concrete. You have to obviously restrict the sulphate content. Sulphate again, you need to be careful as to how much sulphate loading the fly ash is bringing in, because this sulphate will contribute to the other issues that you may have related to sulphates in concrete, like sulphate attack. Internal sulphate attack or delay retrograde formation could also be a possibility sometimes when excess sulphate is brought in. Magnesium oxide content, why? Because it causes unsoundness, it causes unsoundness. Then alkali content. Alkali content is obviously important because too much alkali would lead to alkali aggregate reaction in case aggregates are reactive. But even in that case, even if the alkali content is high in your mineral additives, much of this alkali gets bound by the mineral additives and is not available to react with the aggregate. Even if the alkali is brought in by mineral additive, it is still not really a big problem because a lot of this alkali does not get available for the aggregate to react. Now, that means when I start making blended cement, I can now relax my alkali content limits to some extent. I will talk about that again when we discuss silica fume and slag and the effect on ASR. Right? Moisture content obviously is important from the point of view of understanding in a stockpile or in, in a silo containing fly ash, what is the moisture content so that you can take that into account when you decide on the mix water for your concrete. This is only applicable when fly ash is directly used as a mineral additive. Now, fly ash reacts slowly, so setting time is going to get increased. Okay. Workability and flow of concrete are expected to be increased because of the spherical nature of the fly ash particles. And just like air voids, the spherical nature of 
flash particles lends a ball bearing type effect that increases the flowability of the system. Bleeding and segregation generally will be reduced, why? Why should bleeding and segregation get reduced when fly ash is used? You have finer particles and you have a greater volume of powder because you are replacing cement by a less dense material. So, you have a greater volume of powder, more fines are there in your system which will prevent water from rising up to the surface and bleeding. So, paste volume is definitely getting increased when replacement of cement by mass is done. Okay. I talked about this earlier that you could also replace by volume in which case you preserve the volume of the powder, but here when you replace by mass which is the com conventionally followed mechanism of mixed design you are going to be leading to an increase in paste volume and that may have effects on other properties dimensional stability primarily creep and shrinkage you can expect that there is some increase in creep and shrinkage because of the paste volume, but data does not show conclusively that that is the case. I will talk about that in just a minute. Now, setting time with fly ash concrete is definitely slowed down as compared to plain cement concrete, but what it turns out is that if you start adding some fine additives like silica fume or fine limestone to the system, it compensates the delay in setting time to a large extent. So, there is some advantage in doing a ternary blended system which has limestone as an additive in addition to the fly ash in the cementitious system and that will sort of help compensate for the delay in setting that happens due to fly ash. Now, wh why is the delay in setting a problem on a job site? Sorry, removal of form work is delayed, so that reduces the productivity of your system. What else? What other problems can come? let us say you have a slab and this concrete is not setting for a long time, what kind of problems can happen in a slab because of slow setting of concrete? Already your bleeding is reduced, the slab surface is exposed during the first day, so it can lead to plastic shrinkage problems. Yeah? If the concrete is not setting fast enough, the water inside the concrete now has an opportunity to start drying out. And when that happens, if the water from the surface dries out, whereas the bulk of the concrete underneath is not drying, it is going to restrain the top surface from contracting because of shrinkage and that restraint will lead to cracking. So, in concrete mixes which are highly flowable first of all and which have significant bits of fly ash in it, that will lead to delayed setting and such delayed setting can make the concrete susceptible to plastic shrinkage cracking. So, that is a very important consideration most mineral additives will lend concrete more susceptible to plastic shrinkage cracking not just fly ash most mineral additives will do that. 